Good evening. It's uh, March 30th, uh, Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. Sorry for the little minor delay. This is MED 110, uh, Anatomy and Physiology. It is now week three. What is due this evening at 6 p.m.? Task two, discussion two, and I believe the majority of you don't uh, have to submit uh, lesson two if you were on uh, last week. Is this, is this correct? Let me see if this was the same thing. Yeah, if you were on, uh, if you were logged in for last week, uh, you don't need to do lesson two, but if you weren't, you owe me lesson two today. So task two, discussion two for the majority of the class. And this week is uh, week three. And as promised, we're gonna talk about uh, organelles or what's inside the cell. Now, the cell, uh, this guy Leeuwenhoek, uh, was of course this, um, he was this a German optician, a guy who makes uh, glasses. And you know, if you look at, uh, if you look at, um, uh, what do you call that? If you look at like a bucket of water that's been sitting outside for a while, um, you'll see that it's like there's floating things in it and, and there's things moving around in it. And then if you look at those floating things, um, there's things even inside it that are even floating and moving around still. And Leeuwenhoek, this guy called a cell uh, and the things inside it, he actually called the cell a little beastie, like it was its own animal. And in a way, a cell is its own living thing. And it has all these uh, things inside the cell. Um, and um, it, it acts like a, like a little, you know, like a little human being. So a human being has to have a brain, it has to have some protection, it has to eat, and it also has to defecate. And that's what the, uh, the cell does uh, as well. Now, there's these lovely uh, uh, Carolina notes right here within task three. If you click on this and it's in the same format, uh, there's these lovely notes in here. And these are the things we're talking about. And there's this really neat, quick, um, um, like structures that we're going to be talking about that are inside the cell and their function. And this is an anatomy structure and physiology function. So this is like a, um, a nice quick, um, you know, uh, um, matching thing that you can also do. And it has really nice quick notes and that's why we put them in there. So that's the main thing that we're going to talk about is the what's inside a cell and how does it, how does the cell work? We're also going to be talking specifically about the cell membrane, um, of course, organelles, and uh, briefly touch on this, uh, the different types of cell, eukaryote versus prokaryote. But the main part of today is how is the cell organized? What are the organelles or the little organs or uh, structures within this little beastie to keep it alive? And what are their function? So that chart that I quickly um, uh, passed over in these Carolina notes, that's essentially the majority of this lecture. So let's begin and let's look at a classic, let's see if I can find a nice picture. And um, the classic picture that I always use here it is. Let's see if that, and no, it's too small. I want something a little bit bigger than that. Oh, this one will do. Or do, do, do. let's, ooh, this one's really specific, but let's find a, maybe this one. It's the same picture, but bigger. Yes, and nicer. So let's do a look at that. Or I could take it, copy the image, and let's put in a Microsoft Word so we can see it. All right. And so let's look at this make it a little bit less distorted. Now, the cell, if you look at it, you got to think of the cell like a, um, like a human being. So a human being 
has a brain. And the brain here that directs all the functions is this whole entire pink and purple thing. This whole entire thing here is the nucleus. Now they call the nucleus the brains of the cell, but it's it, it's more like um, um, it how it, it's more like a storage that houses the DNA. Now what's DNA? Deoxyribonucleic acid, and we talked about that last week. And DNA is the blueprint of who we are. And if you look at this chromatin, this is the relaxed DNA, all here. And the nucleolus, which is different than the whole entire nucleus, the nucleolus is the very, very tightly packed concentrated DNA. So the whole entire nucleus is known as the brains of the cell. It has its own membrane or covering, you could see here. So it, 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 it serves as a gateway or a, a wall to prevent bad things from going in and only the things that it wants going out. Now that's a theme with the entire cell wall. And we're gonna, we're gonna show you that momentarily. So this picture right here, the entire thing, that's the nucleus, also known as the brains of the cell. It houses the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. The DNA could be in the relaxed form, which is chromatin. And the relaxed form is the one that will, um, uh, we decode the message and then send it to the RNA, and that will go outside of this nucleus and then project the message of what the nucleus wants the cell to do. So the chromatin, relaxed DNA, the nucleolus, concentrated DNA that's all packed tightly here. And that's all the entire nucleus or known as the brains of the operation or the brains of the cell. So it tells the cell, this is what we're gonna do. Now. For example, if the DNA says that you're going to be a heart cell, then that's what this thing is going to be. <clears throat> if the DNA says you're going to be um, a liver cell, then that's what this thing go is going to be. So that's what we mean by DNA or the blueprint of uh, what the cell is going to be. Now, how does it do that? Well, it's a code and we're gonna talk about that next week and uh, the specifics of the code and what DNA looks like chemically. But just for now, just know it's instructions. And then it gives it to the RNA and the RNA then brings it outside. And then it brings it to this, see this ribbon like thing here? And it's got, if you look real close, it's got bumps on it. That is your rough endoplasmic reticulum, also known as your RER. And they call it rough endoplasmic reticulum to um, differentiate it from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is this. This ribbon-like structure is different because it, see all these little dots and all these little bumps? Those are called ribosomes. And ribosomes are um, protein makers. And that's why we have to have the DNA. The DNA is encoded in a specific sequence. It gives it to the RNA that then gets encoded more to a specific sequence. And that specific sequence tells the ribosomes, these little bumps on this rough endoplasmic reticulum, it tells it, um, this is the order of amino acids connected to a peptide bond to make a protein. And we've already talked about proteins. It's really, really important in our body. Now, the DNA also has RNA to send messages to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum with its ribosomes will make proteins. So this rough ER is the protein factory. This smooth ER is the carbohydrate and lipid factory. So this protein factory, rough ER, and this the smooth ER that doesn't have little bumps on it, that is the um, um, carbohydrate and lipid. And doesn't that cover the three major macromolecules? And the fourth macromolecule is DNA and RNA? All right here, this should amaze you, all right here in this tiny little space. And remember, this is inside the cell, okay? So it's microscopic. Now, Again, um, uh, the ribosomes are, um, are protein makers or protein factories. 
Now you can also find ribosomes in this yellow stuff, but they're free. They're just like floating around little dots. And this is the, all that yellow stuff is the cytosol. And um, uh, that's like the jelly-like substance that keeps all of this stuff, you know, organized, you know, keeps uh, the smooth ER over there, the rough ER over there and the nucleus in its place. Okay, and what dictates all its organization is the DNA that's inside the nucleus. So we have the rough ER and the smooth ER. We're, we're good with that. Now, the, um, all of this requires energy. And we talked about how we're constantly breathing oxygen and we're constantly eating to break down into uh, glucose, which is the, six, is the basic uh, monosaccharide six carbon sugar. Now you take that glucose and then oxygen and you put it inside one of these. Here's another one here. This is your mitochondria. Now the mitochondria is known as the powerhouse of the cell. It's because it takes the glucose and oxygen and makes adenosine triphosphate. Let's write this thing down. I forgot I was already in Microsoft Word. So remember we talked about the two substrates, glucose plus oxygen. And it's going to give me ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. So if you look at adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, this is what it kind of looks like. It's a ribose group connected to an adenine group, and it has three phosphate groups in it. Hence the term adenosine tri one, two, three phosphate. Now, the important thing about ATP is see these bonds right here, this one, and then this one, those are high energy bonds. Now, remember we talked about energy and uh, electrons and all that stuff uh, last week. Well, what happens when I break one of these bonds? The energy that's required to keep this bond alive gets released. And that is the true thing that's keeping you alive, all of us alive right now, is ATP. And you need that because you need it. I eat all day and I breathe all day. The second you stop eating and the, step, uh, the second you stop breathing, then you will stop making this. And once you stop making this, then you have no more energy for your muscles. You have no more energy. So ATP gets hydrolyzed or broken down into ADP. So if I break that bond, this will become ADP or adenosine diphosphate. And then I break this bond down and then it'll be adenosine monophosphate. And then it gets recycled all the way around because as long as I'm, remember back to this picture, as long as I'm eating and metabolizing food, and as long as I'm breathing, I have ATP. And that's the major function of this mitochondrion or the powerhouse of the cell. Oh, where's the word mitochondrion? Here, here. Mitochondrion, and that's what this are. And then you could see it's got uh, all these little um, uh, labyrinth and pathways, um, and it houses something called the electron transport chain. Uh, just know that the electron transport chain takes glucose and oxygen and makes ATP out of it. And I'm spending a little bit of time on this because I believe that's your discussion for this week. What happens if this thing goes down? What happens if I can no longer make ATP? And then you could research that. Another thing that you'll look at this cytosol here, right? It's all jelly-like, but do you guys notice there's these like lines in there, right? Well, those lines are proteins and they're called microtubules. And it is like the scaffolding or, you know, like the framework, like the skeleton that holds everything up. And it also provides like little roadways or pathways. For example, the centrioles here, the centrioles, uh, let's, let's show you what they're used for. Um, uh... The centrioles are important because when we start doubling up the DNA right before uh, the cell gets to divide, didn't you ever wonder how does the cell know where to go? You know, it splits in half, but how does the genetic material know which side to go? Well, the centrosomes or the centrioles 
for it goes, they start uh, connecting all of those microtubule protein chains that I was talking about. And then one side will pull in one set of genes, right? Which is, this is DNA in the shape of a chromosome. And uh, that's a, it is now more relaxed DNA. And then it'll pull another set over here. So that when it splits like this, you have an even amount. You have one set that'll go over here and one set that go over here. And also the neat part is, is they'll mix and match, right? Um, and we need variety to keep alive. Um, that's why all these people talking about how, you know, um, we should only grow one type of plant or we only should, we only should have one type of human being. Um, the, those idiots have no idea what, what biological science is. Biological science dictates that there must be variability in order to stay alive. That's why people who are have very very closed social groups, and you know they 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 only like like you know back in the day kings and queens only only like um, you know marry and have children with other kings and queens. Well, after a while, it starts having some genetic problems because genetics loves variability. But you know it's also the main reason why you know as gross as it sounds and it is gross why you you shouldn't have children with your with your sibling because the genetics is too close and just know that bio it's called bioavailability and and um um, um not bioavailability uh, biodiversity that's why these genetic plants that we're having we keep on making the same kinds of crops monsanto and all these uh, uh big um um, these big companies, they're playing with fire when they play with, when, when, when they're playing with that kind of thing. It's good in one way, we're making bigger, badder, better plants to feed the world. But in another way, we're like, you know, uh, we're, we're messing with stuff. Um, but again, just know what the centrosomes or centrioles are used for. They interconnect during um, cell division and it, it has a nice little railway or pathway for the genes or the, the chromosomes in this case, the DNA to, you know, separate. And this is what it looks like. And then it separates and then you have two, okay? So wait a minute, where was I? Back to the picture. So that's what these are for. That's what the microtubules are for. Um, and they provide a roadway. Now you can't have, just like in your house, you can't have garbage like if you have garbage in your house of course you're going to put it in a plastic bag and you're going to package it also if you have something precious you're going to put it in a box and package it because you don't want anything to happen to it while it's moving around your house well that's why we have the post office right here and that's called your golgi apparatus now the golgi apparatus uh they sometimes they call it the post office of the cell or the fedex of the cell do you see what it's doing it's taking all these granules or stuff and it's like uh, making little bubbles. These bubbles could be in the form of a lysosome, which is what's inside there is products that will perform lysis or products that will uh, lyse or break down, you know, um, garbage products or uh, if it has to digest something. Um, it could also um, 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 package uh, anything that the uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum makes. And remember the smooth ER that makes uh, carbohydrates and, um, and uh, fats. And it also could package proteins in the form of um, chemical messengers like neurotransmitters and, um, and hormones. And that could, you could see how it gets packaged. And then it uh, sits on the, um, plas um, the plasma here your uh, plasma membrane, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. Hold up, I'm just going to shut this off. The plasma membrane here, and then it'll release it. So if the DNA instructions to this cell is to be, uh, is to release things, then it'll tell the Golgi what to do. So the Golgi is the post office of the cell and it packages these things up. And you don't want these lysosomes broke, you know, falling around in your house. It's like, you don't want, like, let's say I'm, um, I'm, I'm carrying bleach around the house. I'm not going to hold it in my hand, right? It could fall out. It, it could do a lot of damage. So we got to package it up and, 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 or something precious, like a gift, like in the form of neurotransmitters or in the form of hormones, right? Uh, you want it safe. So it doesn't, you know, 
gets dispersed here, gets trapped here. Another form of breakdown uh, um, uh, product is your peroxisome, peroxide, right? A peroxisome and lysosomes, they break down things, either foreign bodies or, or anything that gets into the cell. Now, you see how this has a membrane and this also has a plasma membrane and we'll talk about the plasma membrane in a moment, right? So there's so many things protecting the cell. You have peroxisomes, you have lysosomes, right? It's, it's its own little immune system. You also have um, your plasma membrane here. You also have your nuclear membrane. Now, for all of these people who saying, oh, your mask protects you against the virus, let me tell you right now, the size of a virus is smaller than that dot that I'm pointing at. A virus can, if it wants, a virus can go in here, attach to the cell wall, go in here, go in here, and then go in here, like in the form of HIV, uh, it attaches onto your RNA and it's a retrovirus. And then the, it tells the RNA to tell the DNA what to do. And instead of, hold up, my kids are a little bit noisy. Hey. Okay, I'm back. So if it's smaller than that, then why it goes, why did they keep on saying the mask is gonna somehow protect you? That's, don't you find that insane? That's a little bit on the insane side. The mask is not there to protect you against the virus. If the virus wants in, it wants in and it'll get in. And that's what viruses do. They just wanna live, they go in there. But why do we wear our PPE? Why does the virus get in here? If you recall, I believe it was week one or week two where we had the chain of infection. Remember we talked about susceptible host. If the susceptible host, if the immune system is down, then the odds of the virus coming in is greater. Therefore, the 250 th things that could enter your, uh, your body, if you wear your PPE, if you do your distancing and all of that, it decreases the chance and it decreases um, uh, the odds of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the odds of you getting sick. Like, for example, every six months I used to get bronchitis or whatever, but because of social distancing, I'm not around people. I'm wearing a mask all day. You're not allowed to touch anybody. Oh, last time I got really, really sick was I think March, 2019, March, April, 2019. And that's weird for me. So it's almost two years where, uh, you know, I haven't been coughing, uh, coughing out a lung or, or, or whatnot. And actually, a lot of the lower respiratory tract infections are going down. Um, a, a lot of the other uh, vir viruses that um, plague, especially our older population and our immunocompromised uh, population are down. Worldwide, tuberculosis is down. And so if you wanna look at a silver lining at all this uh, mask wearing and social distancing and, 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 and all of these things, it, that's probably it. But do know and understand that um, I could uh, I could wear a, a level three biohazard um, biohazard suit. If a virus wants to get in, it'll get in. And if it's that small, um, it that's why on the scale of things, that's why it's so scary, and it's so insidious. And you don't you and um, uh, it's really it, it's really the best bet is keep yourself positive, keep yourself healthy. Uh, and wear your PPE, follow the rules, um, especially when you're working. And that's actually what we're going to do when we go into lab. If any of you have ever um, um, uh, come, into, uh, come into our labs at Alexandria. So instead of scaring you, well, I hope I'm not scaring you. I am hope I'm like educating you so that when it goes, when you start seeing all these little pithy things on, you know, uh, on CNN or whatnot, and actually, Honestly, just don't watch. If you're a scientist, just don't watch it anymore. Um, they pick and choose which data they want to put up, and it's kind of it's kind of sick to watch. Um, um, it'll, it'll just be much much better for your uh, for your health if uh, you know just read and read um, science things. So what science tells us is that now you can see even before we talked about this plasma membrane, it's it's its own world. It's its own organism in a way and hence the term organelles. All of these things that we're talking about are organelles. They're little organs in this little beastie that Leeuwenhoek took. Now, uh, microvilli, microfilaments, 
Sometimes the cell has to move around. Sometimes the cell has to move thing or move things around. So there's little out pocketings of these little fingers. And it's usually either for motility where the cell has to move around or in the case of your uh, uh, villi and your cilia in your uh, gastrointestinal tract, it's either for, um, it's to help move mu mucus around. And also if you look at it, it increases the surface area when they do stuff like that. So it's really good for um, absorptive or absorption uh, functions. So knowing and seeing this, let's minimize this and let's go back to, uh, this um, cell structure and function in the Carolina book and the Carolina notes in task three. We talked all about this, nucleons, yada, 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 yada. So ribosomes, those, those little bumps, that's protein synthesis, rough endoplasmic reticulum, processing and transport of proteins. So uh, think of the ribosomes as the protein factory workers and the rough endoplasmic reticulum as the protein factory. And the workers, the ribosomes could be also floating around. They don't necessarily have to be associated with the RER, but the rough endoplasmic reticulum definitely has ribosomes on it. You have your smooth ER, that's lipid and carbohydrate metab or production, right? Golgi apparatus, processing and transport of things. And that's the, um, the FedEx or the post office. Lysosomes and peroxisomes, they break down things, right? Digestion catabolism, right? Um, and catabolism means uh, um, breakdown. And uh, so that you can break down things. And, uh, and if you're breaking down fatty acids, you're, you're, you're trying to um, open up the fatty acids so to release glucose. Mitochondria, ATP production, also known as the powerhouse of the cell. Centrioles, organization and movement during cell division. Cilia, flagella. That's those uh, little finger-like uh, projections that are on the outside. Um, uh, microfilaments, we didn't mention too well, intermediate filaments. The filaments or those uh, protein chains that I talked about in the cytoplasm, in the jelly, that's what we're talking about, the strength and support. It's kind of like a scaffolding. And they're in the form of microtubules. And microtubules are simply proteins that are uh, kind of like the way your hair is formed. It's, it's, it's proteins that are formed in a, um, like, 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 like in a tight spiral and it makes a tube. Um, let us now go to this topic, which is the plasma membrane. And let's get my classic plasma membrane picture that I always, always, I always, always use. Oh, someone took my nice picture and put words all over it. That's weird. This is the original picture. And it's from a textbook that we used to use. Let us, but that textbook is ridiculously expensive. And um, I get a textbook when I could, I could clearly and easily show you what I mean. So let's look at this. Just like your nuclear membrane, you got a covering on the outside. And the covering is called your plasma membrane. And this plasma membrane is a uh, phospholipid bilayer, meaning that see these little strings that are coming out? Those are, um, uh, those are lipids. And see these little bumps, these little pink bumps? That's a phosphorus head. So those are phospholipids, phosphorus head with a uh, lipid, lipid chain connecting to it. And then it's a bilayer. And this bilayer forms the, phospho, the, the phosphorus on the top forms a hydrophilic uh, environment. So the little phosphorus heads love water. And it makes sense because there's water on the outside of the cell and there's water on the inside of the cell in the form of the cytosol. Right or that gel-like substance that we that this yellow stuff that we talked about. Now, what's neat about it is, it has a hydrophobic inner layer, and that keeps the water here on the outside, outside, and the fluid or water here on the inside, on the inside. 
And that's also part of the thing that remember what I talked, I asked about, I was a kid and I always wondered why, when you jump in the pool, you don't fall apart. Well, number one bonds, number two, because you have these natural barriers that we make and you're making this barrier out of a phospholipid bilayer. So what kind of questions could I ask you? I could ask you, um, what's on the outside, lipid or a phosphate group? And you'll say phosphorus or phosphate group. It's on the outside. Is that hydrophilic or hydrophobic? It's hydrophilic because there's water on the outside and there's water on the inside. Now, how about this lipid chain? Well, what do we already know about the solubility of fats? You can't mix, you can't mix oil and water. Therefore, it is the inside of this that is hydrophobic. And it will push water out here. So it'll keep the water uh, that's out here, out here. And it'll keep the water that's in here, in here. The second I poke holes in it, like I would if it was penicillin, the way we kill um, bacteria with penicillin is the penicillin pokes holes in this uh, mosaic pattern here, in this phospholipid bilayer of the bacteria. And then uh, the cell does what? Just disintegrates. Now, you'll also see this stuff in blue. Uh, this stuff would be like, you know, kind of flimsy if it didn't have integral membrane proteins or uh, proteins like this and this all throughout it to give it a little bit rigidity. Another thing that the proteins can do is they can form little pathways and little trap doors here, right? And those are protein channels. And the protein channel um, is chemically selective of what it wants to go in and what it wants to go out and who dictates all what, what, get, what gets in and what goes out. Not only chemistry, but remember the DNA or the blueprint. So for example, you have the hormone that gets released um, and it is uh, insulin. So insulin, know that glucose is a big molecule. It's six carbon chain, uh, C6, H12, O6, it's, it's big, right? And um, it can't go through this, this wall, right? And even it can't go through some of these uh, um, channel proteins. But once it attaches on one of these glycolipids or glycoproteins, and it acts like a lock, the insulin will then open this channel, and then the insulin now can go in. And if the insulin goes in, what can happen? Now, I mean, I mean, once the insulin opens the door, glucose can go, can go in. And if glucose, the big glucose molecule can go in, don't you think we need that for our mitochondria? And that's why after you eat a heavy meal, the um, uh, insulin is like a key that opens up a door to let glucose in. Now, here's an, another interesting thing about glucose metabolism. I just, uh, uh, my daughter and I just uh, came back to, uh, came back from the gym, right? And um, what else opens these doors? Exercise. Um, you have these two back doors, GLUT2, GLUT3 um, um, proteins. Um, they don't need, they don't need insulin to open the door. So you can get sugar inside the cell where it belongs because diabetes is sugar being on the outside itself, causing all this horrific damage. And that's actually how neurotransmitters and hormones and chemical messengers work. They work on this glycolipid and glycolipid, glyco meaning sugar, lipid, right? A little sticking out here, or glycoproteins. And they act on, uh, uh, they act on it so that the cell then does stuff. Another thing that these glycoproteins do is they are also identifiers of what the cell is. Um, like, didn't you ever wonder how does your body know what to attack and what not to attack? Well, just like in a normal war, right? We all have, you know, the soldiers all have uniforms. So your body should have the right jacket or the right glycoprotein coat to tell your immune system, hey, don't kill me, right? But if it doesn't, like in case of like a foreign body or a potentially pathogenic cell, like a virus or a, a bacteria, if it doesn't have the right glycoprotein coat, what's going to happen? The macrophage is going to jump right on it and gobble it all up. So 
Lastly, let's talk about cholesterols. You know about cholesterol, right? It's a thing that no one likes. Um, you have HDL and LDL and VLDL. And you may have heard that the HDL or high density lipoprotein is the good cholesterol and uh, the low density lipoprotein and the very low density lipoprotein, LDL and VLDL uh, uh, respectively, those are the quote unquote bad um, cholesterols. There's no such thing as a good or bad cholesterol, right? But they're also inside this membrane and they're also transport systems. So the HDL is the transport system to take fat or outside the cell. It pushes it to the outside. And what's LDL and VLDL? They take fat and then they push it where? Towards the inside of the cell. And there's more, there's more of uh, cholesterol of the VLDL and LDL variety because you know, back in caveman and cavewoman days, you don't know when we were going to eat. So your body had to be able to deal with, you know, um, um, storing, uh, storing um, glucose in the form of fat very, very efficiently, right? But now in the world of uh, all I do is hop in my car and um, uh, sit in front of a computer all day, you have more fat coming in than going out. But again, how do you utilize that? You, you less intake and, um, um, and working out more. Um, and that's, that's what everyone should be trying to do because again, I'm, I'm always going to mention it. Um, once you get diabetes, you can't go back. And once you have, once you're diagnosed with diabetes, the clock starts ticking on when you, uh, when you will have all the other comorbidities and you don't want that on your list. Um, and again, I'm on my soapbox. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're talking about all these, uh, uh millions of people. Uh, who are affected by COVID. I think we should be paying attention to the millions of people um, who will get affected with hypertension, juvenile diabetes, and kidney disease. Um, I'd be where I goes, uh, everyone's talking about all these other political things instead of the one thing that no one wants to deal with. And, um, but me, I only can deal with what I can deal with in my own realm. And my own realm is my own body, which is not doing so hot right now. So what do I got to do? I got to make sure that what? The right stuff gets to go in and um, I have to exercise so that um, my body will burn up glucose and um, burn, up some, burn up some fat. And, uh, and also um, the, uh, what the real important part of the show is here is uh, if you can do this and answer all the, answer the match the left with the right, you'll be dead on. If you can look at that picture and identify what's what, uh, you will be, because this portion of your midterm will be very, very easy. Um, now, how do things go in and out? Well, if it's soluble, meaning to say is that it is, that it's permeable through the plasma membrane, then, the gradient is usually a concentration gradient from a, um, and we already discussed this regarding diffusion. It's a concentration from um, uh, of a high concentration always to a low concentration. And the example that we used was, you know, uh, if ever uh, you guys ever go back to the mall ever again, um, you know, when you go to the mall and the lovely lady or gentleman sprays um, the perfume, right? The perfume right at the perfume counter is super, super concentrated. But over time, what happens? The molecules will then spread out. And that's diffusion, going from a concentration of a high concentration to a low concentration. But there are several times uh, in our processes where we have to go against that uh, grain, right? We have to go from a concentration of low to high. And if that's the case, then we need, remember, well, let me go back to, I'm now, let's go back to this. So if the concentration is higher out here, let's say for example, salt, and the concentration here is low in salt, then what's gonna happen? Once these channel open, right? 
it's just going to fall in from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Well, sometimes we want to move ions, the pluses and minuses, in and out against their gradient. And anytime we do that, um, it's usually when the body wants to conduct electricity. And we have little bit, itty bits of electricity all throughout our nerves, all throughout our brain. And uh, so there's going to be a pump that pumps things against the gradient. So let's say, for example, um, um, I don't want to get into that example. We'll, we'll just say that I want to pump stuff out. And even though there's more, let's say I want to pump sodium out. Even though there's more sodium here, I want to pump against the gradient. And in order to do that, I'm going to need energy. And remember the thing that I was had written down here before I erased it? The thing that this makes? So what will there be? There'll be a pump here that has a that that will process ATP and the pump will pump against the gradient. So if you want to pump something against the gradient, you're going to need energy to do it. And what's the energy? What's the molecular energy that we've been talking about all this time? Is ATP and it's coming from here. It's coming from this mitochondria right here. All right, let's get back to uh, uh, mm. now different things uh, this is and it makes sense let's go through these if there's a greater concentration gradient let's say there's way more sodium on the outside and there's very little sodium on the inside then that will force the speed of the diffusion um temperature if um um, temperature in, in general, if it's, uh, if it's raised, the molecules will move faster and then that'll speed it up as well. Surface area, and I mentioned that regarding absorption, if the surface area is greater, you'll have greater absorption. Now, diffusion is an area from high concentration to low concentration. But if I do that diffusion through a semi-permeable membrane, which is this, this is a semi-permeable membrane, it lets some things in, it lets some things out, and that's called osmosis. Now, let's look at what osmosis means. And let's look at our, let's pretend that this, right, is a semi-permeable membrane. And this is um, um, box A, this is box B, but they're connected and water, and a solute can go in and out, okay? Now, what's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to be in an isotonic solution, right? And uh, the isotonic solution for normal human beings is normal saline or NSS, and that's 0.9% sodium chloride solution. And that's, uh, that's isotonic. Now, because of you know, the protein channels, protein pumps, and all that other stuff, this, or depending on you know, your diet, or if you're dehydrated, there's a whole bunch of things. You could have, uh, let's call the, um, let's call these little, uh, these little white circles, that'll be the water molecules. So if we look on, this is A and this is B. If we look on, on box B, there's one, two, three, four, five, six water molecules. Okay, so there's six water molecules of water here in B. There's one, two, three, four, five, six also in A. So it's the same amount of water, but let's call these little black dots, let's call them sodium or salt. But here in A, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. But here in B, there's only one or two. So box A would be a hypertonic solution. Box B would be hypotonic. Hyper, a lot. Hypo, less. Now, over the course of time, if we didn't apply any energy to this semi-permeable membrane or this fake plasma membrane that we have here, what will happen? Things will go left, right, left, right. And what will happen? You will have an isotonic solution. There's one, two, three, four sodium here. One, two, three, four sodium here. One, two, three, four, five, six 
water here, one, two, three, four, five, six, water there. So if I look at this, this is an isotonic solution. And in the case of, uh, of human beings, it's NSS, 0.9% sodium chloride. But this, you see there's way more salt. So in this, if there's a way more salt or way more solute, way more powder in my Kool-Aid, this is more concentrated, also known as a hypertonic solution. This only has what? Two dots of salt. So this is a hypotonic, right? And eventually, if you have equilibrium, that is an isotonic. Same amount of sodium, same amount of water. And iso means the same. So could I put these little diagrams up? I could ask you, what's A, what's B? What's A, what's B? Is this, uh, um, is this an equilibrium or is this an equilibrium? And of course, this is equilibrium. This is isotonic. We used to do this really, really messy experiment using K-Rose syrup and these huge, like, I don't know, um, these like silly looking condom stuff and all this water. Oh, it was years ago. Um, it was just a mess and it almost never showed it. I think it's just better just to, hey, here's these pictures and so you can make a little bit more sense out of it. Now, when, when the molecules start flowing either left or right, it's going to exert pressure, okay? So let's say, for example, we're talking about osmotic pressure. So since this is a higher concentration of salt versus the one and two versus one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, so the osmotic pressure gradient will be from what? Box A? to go into box B. And that's what osmotic pressure is. And that's why, uh, didn't you ever wonder why your blood moves from one place to another? Why oxygen moves in and out of your lungs? Why carbon dioxide moves in and out of your lungs? Didn't you ever wonder what goes, uh, how, that, how that all happens? Well, this thing right here, which is essentially the basics of chemistry and this thing called osmotic pressure, okay? Ugh, I hated this. First. The worst lab. I just like cutting up stuff. It's more fun. So let's see. Did we go over cell structure? Yup. Organelles? Yup. Function of organelles? So I think we're good. So let us now look at discussion three and see what that's all about. Now, that's easy. You could watch the video or not. But what would happen if I had a disease, and there are diseases, if the mitochondria was destroyed or uh, uh, negatively affected. 200 to 250 words on mitochondrial diseases and goes uh, the role of the mitochondria and how did the sinus symptoms come about, okay? So right off the bat, if you don't have, you don't have any energy, then how do you feel? Of course, you're gonna feel tired. You, uh, do you think you're uh, gonna breathe very well? Nope, right? So there's a whole bunch of things and relate, relate your anatomy and physiology to pathology, which is the study of disease and to, of course, symptomology, which is the thing that, uh, of course, you future nurses and future clinicians better be having your uh, paying attention to. You could sit there in pathology and try to memorize everything, which is the downfall of most people who take pathology. Um, I almost failed pathology the first time around in medical school because I tried to memorize everything. But then I got the trick at the end of the year. The trick is know your normal anatomy and physiology and just mess with it. So that's what discussion three is about and do next week um, uh, by next class session, next Tuesday, right? And uh, uh, 200, 250 words. Some of you write a textbook. I don't need that, right? If you're getting to the thousand word level, and I can also show you where many of you are actually being redundant. Uh, you guys are so used to, some of you are so used to writing just to look good. No, uh, um, uh, my best papers and my best work were like, let's say for example, it's a 15 page paper or a 20 page paper. Um, I'll hand in 17 pages, but they'll be solid 17. Um, but I've also seen papers where it's 30 page papers on a 20 page paper still get a C because it's what? It's 10 pages of good stuff and 20 pages of fluff. Uh, so remember, when you're doing a discussion, have a introduction, define your terms, 
And then your middle part is the evidence that'll back up your uh, introduction and your rationale on, on what you believe is going on. And then of course the conclusion. Now, if you believed one thing and then your research showed you something else, shouldn't that be in your conclusion? Something to think about because that, that's what education uh, um, that's what education is uh, uh, doing to us, right? It will do what? It can change your mind. Uh, I don't agree with everything that, you know, that lunatic who, uh, that guy Crowder who sits on a, um, he sits on a desk and he says these inflammatory things uh, on colleges. And then uh, he says, oh, change my mind. Well, he has a pretty, that's a, that's a pretty neat thing, even though I don't really believe in his, in his politics, but that's a pretty neat thing to sit down and ask yourself, like, uh, like is what is going on is is it real and uh, like for mitochondrial disease he goes is it it goes is it real okay and he goes then what is the link from the anatomy physiology pathology and symptomology uh, lesson three uh, don't need to look at this uh, these are all just the same things that we're uh, going over regarding mitochondria and these nice little pictures this is the worst video here. Please don't watch this video. Uh, I'm going to show you another video on how ribosomes get made uh, uh, very, very different. Um, here's more osmosis and diffusion notes. I think it's the same. And here's cell structure and function. It's the same exact uh, notes. But what is due next week regarding the case? You click here on the case and the very then download. Now, um, read this part one, answers questions one through five. And uh, uh, read, uh, go through part two and answers questions uh, one through seven. So it's part one, one through five, part two, questions one through seven. Okay, and answer, uh, please, some of you, full question, I mean, full sentences, please. And, um, and also, um, Oh, what else? Uh, what was the other thing about the just full? And also, when you put the file, uh, put your name on it somewhere because when I'm reading it, uh, um, the original file that you guys upload, and uh, sometimes I I get a little lost on, and then I have to backtrack on who's what. Um, and also, you know, for legal purposes, if ever they want to look back on grades, they want to see like, oh, did this person really write it? So again, part one, one through five, and read this horrific story about bringing home this baby who has a genetic disorder and then how they get the diagnosis. And they pick this very, very rare uh, Lay syndrome. Uh, and then it's one through seven. Now, what I wanna go over is this, but not regarding this case. I, want, um, I wanna go over genetics, but on the classic, um, um, the, the classic situation is sickle cell. Uh, so, oh, they even have the same exact picture. Okay. So, if you look at, let me, let's get this picture. And I want to, I want to put it here and I'm going to draw on it. Okay. So if you look at this picture and these are, uh, whoever is colored totally, they have full-blown sickle cell disease. Whoever is colored like halfway, they only have the sickle cell trait. So their, their symptoms will be far less than this person with sickle cell disease. And this person will be, I don't, uh, will have no blood disorder. Now, how can we kind of predict that, right? Well, if we look and uh, Genetics, you have something called, um, um, let me insert. So 
some definitions here. Now you have genotype and you have phenotype. Phenotype, I want you to think about physical. Okay? It is the physical attributes. So the physical attribute of, of this child is sickle cell disease. The phenotype or the physical attribute for these two children are sickle cell trait, right? They're carriers. And they have far, uh, very, very mild symptomology compared to your, your full-blown sickle cell. And this particular patient, or not patient, but uh, this child or progeny, the way, the way genetics talks about it is um, normal or typical no blood disorder. Now, what's genotype? Genotype is the genetics. And the way we label the genetics is by letters. So let's use um, big S little, uh, um, if my patient has the genetics SS, right? Uh, for sickle cell, right? That's capital S, capital S. They'll be normal. No blood or not normal. Everyone here is normal, uh, but no blood, uh, no sickle cell. If they have lowercase, lowercase s, they have full-blown sickle cell disease. Okay. Now, if they have a combo, big S, little s, then they have sickle cell trait. Okay. So, we could assign, right, capital S, little s, let me draw. Um, I like purple. Okay. So mommy is a carrier and we could see, and genotypically we would assign a capital S and a little s. Right? Daddy, same, capital S and a little s. Now, fell in love, got married, had a bunch of kids. What happened? What are the odds? Well, if I get one S from mommy, one capital S from daddy, I'll have what? 25% will be capital S, capital S. The genotype would be homozygous dominant because the capital is dominant. So the homozygous dominant, homo meaning the same, capital S, capital S. Homozygous dominant, no blood disorder. Now, these two kids are 50% of the progeny will have what? They'll have capital S from one parent and a little s from another parent. And the last one, right? So there'll be two of them. The last one will have little s and a little s or lowercase s and lowercase s. So in sickle cell and also lays, right? If I, if I showed you a picture like this, or if I said, um, uh, what are the odds of a mother who has a sickle cell trait, father with sickle cell trait, if, uh, if they had children, what are the odds of uh, the child being, having no blood disorder, 25%. What are the odds of the, or one in four? What are the odds the child will have full-blown sickle cell disease? One in four. And what are the odds the, the, uh, the, uh, the child will have sickle cell trait? Two out of four, which is 50%. And that's what that picture 
going back to this picture that was on your hello that was on uh lays one in four chance 25 percent one over four or one divided by four is 0 0.25 25 percent right carrier or trait two and four two over four is one half one divided by two is 0 0.50 that's 50 percent and again one in four has full-blown disease like that poor little girl in lay syndrome uh that's what 0 0.25 which is 25%. So this is a classic NCLEX question, but in the NCLEX, they take it to the next level. They take it to what if this person and then that person, they don't tell you the, um, uh, the genotype. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll give you the genotype and they'll ask you to predict um, not the first generation. They always ask to predict the second generation because many MCAT and T, not T's, but MCAT and NCLEX questions are double jumpers. I call them double jumpers. You need this to get to this, to get to this. And that's, uh, that's a double jumper. In my exams, it'll be a single jumper. I could ask you, this person right here, oh, that's a carrier. This person right here, because they're heterozygous, right? They're different. Capital, big R, little r, right? They're different. Oh, that's a carrier. This one. Uh, no disease. This one, these two uh, carriers. This one, full blown disease. What are the odds? 25%, 50%, and 25%. That's the worst I'll do to you. Okay. And oh, look at it. Same exact thing. So I believe that is all I have for you guys. So it's at this point of the show, I will stop recording.